welcome viewers to the series of lectures on modern European history and we have earlier been talking of the triumphant march of liberalism alongside of course several other uh, ideas and ideologies most noticeably say nationalism say socialism particularly in the second half of the 19 uh, second half of the 19th century but here today we are discussing liberal gains in britain for the period 1830 to 1848 we all know of the 1848 revolution in different parts of europe and therefore that's the uh, timeline that we are using uh, i have earlier spoken to you with respect to britain as well so there is a uh, there is one uh, episode that we did Uh, with respect to liberal gains in britain from 1815 to 1830 so this happens to be a sequel to that right so you do well to connect it with the uh, discussion that we had with reference to what happened in britain uh, from 1815 that is post the uh, defeat of napoleon uh, that is congress of vienna uh, to 1830 and the story thereafter is what we are going to talk about today uh liberalism is an idea uh in britain particularly uh is to be understood with reference to several incremental advances that uh, we get to see uh at the level of uh, legislative changes and also at the level of real action on ground uh which 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 typified the uh, rising assertion of the middle class and uh the ability of the middle class to simultaneously rein in its radical component that was provided by the uh, lower middle class and the upcoming artisans and industrial workers remember we are talking of britain where industrialization had happened first and there is a, a there is an increasing number of industri uh, industrial workers that we get to see by around this time from say 1830s to 1840s and 1850s so the working class is also becoming more and more politically assertive although uh, that becomes visible uh, only in the second half 19th century uh, so for this period 1830 to 48 by and large the radical elements uh, co uh, which is uh, which is uh, uh, with respect to say the industrial workers the lower uh, middle class etc they are all subsumed under the leadership provided by the bourgeoisie or the middle class uh, a very important milestone in this of course and i had referred to this in my earlier interaction also 1832 reform bill and uh, i'm not uh, repeating it because we have covered this uh, in my uh, earlier discussion so uh, very uh, general uh, level uh, or at a very general level uh, one can say that uh, some share of political power had definitely been accorded to the middle class through this reform bill of 1832 remember the landholders the gentry the uh, the uh, aristocrats in the parliament even in the lower house of british parliament are still there their economic power of course had significantly declined and it is the middle class that's uh, doing more and more business and earning more and more profit and they are also trying to assert politically but in terms of parliamentary representation even in the lower house of uh, the parliament in britain middle class had to wait and uh, it is not up to this up to 1848 that we find very many uh, uh, middle class uh, people in the in the uh, british parliaments nevertheless 1832 reform bills had uh, had uh, created a situation which was more conducive now for the middle class assertion right 
So even the parliament was becoming now more sensitive to industrialist needs and free trade principles. Remember those of us uh, who study Indian history, modern Indian history also remember this 1832 reform uh, bill and its ramification in India. It, it is uh, through these uh, reform bills, uh, this one and uh, the one uh, say 20 years before that the monopoly of East India Company had been done away with. right? So, uh, gradually uh, you will find that losses were principle uh, and several other uh, uh, free trade uh, principles that are uh, more conducive to middle class uh, assertions at this point of time are being put in place. Uh, alongside, uh, since we are talking of Britain, rapid industrialization is always a force. So, this had compelled several legislative interventions of mixed nature on a number of fronts. For example, uh, uh, you had uh, the parliament legislating on issues like public health and through public health measures to improve the life conditions. If you look at the uh, literature uh, around uh, this time uh, in Europe, you will find several writers lamenting uh, the uh, dirty uh, conditions, uh, the pitiable conditions of industrial workers living in different industrial towns. Uh, so, it is it's, uh, disease, it is it's pain, uh, it is uh, filth uh, and also uh, immorality of say prostitution and unethical behavior, they, they, they are uh, spoken of uh, in, in the literature uh, that was generated around this time in, in different forms. right? So, the parliament is responding to it, is, is trying to uh, bring about some changes uh, to, uh, to overcome this, to, to, uh, to do something about it through public health measures and so forth. And very important in this is uh, inaction of laws governing the treatment of paupers or the poor. We will subsequently see how uh, poverty or who are poor gets redefined during this period uh, in contrast to the way it was traditionally understood as. So, there is a new understanding of poverty. The onus uh, is no more on the system. Poverty is not born of some systemic failure, rather the responsibility of being poor is vested with the individual. Right? So, that is how uh, it goes and that, that is that's where you have to have a very nuanced understanding of uh, uh, liberal uh, principles, liberal ethos and the liberal uh, you can say ethical uh, environment that is getting created. So, uh, with reference to uh, the treatment of the poors or uh, uh, those uh, who were unemployed did not have a, a secure means of livelihood, the old system which was enacted in 1598 uh, had the system of local parishes uh, that uh, looked after their accommodation in poor houses, they also periodically gave doles uh, to them so that they could sustain themselves. Uh, they also launched some local public employment programs. So, in case they wanted to do something, they could uh, earn a little bit also. Uh, and all these measures uh, gave some kind of a guarantee against starvation. So, people did not die of starvation at least in the pre-industrial times or in the uh, in the times that uh, we are talking of, the, the times prior to the times that we are talking of. That guarantee, that system, that old uh, system was now broken down. Now, there were several reasons. I am not saying that it is only the assertion of liberal values and ethos that was responsible for it. There were several other conditions responsible for it. but. There is some kind of a tacit, uh, you can say, uh, push that was being given to transform uh, these uh, uh, these uh, uh, perceptions 
uh, in this way by the triumphant march of liberalism as well. So, uh, you can uh, look at the issue of population growth, you can look at the issue of economic depression, unemployment, uh, mobility triggered by industrialization, rendering uh, the local parishes uh, almost uh, as an entity that was out of place because uh, you know it used to uh, take care of things that are very localized. It used to be responsible only for local, uh, uh, you know, a particular locality. Whereas localities uh, did not matter much because of uh, the frequency with which the industrial labor had to leave a particular area and go and settle in uh, cities or industrial uh, sites, right? And poverty would occur to them uh, in, in cities, uh, right? And uh, therefore, uh, what is the point of giving doles to uh, or launching uh, some kind of uh, employment programs uh, as part of the efforts by uh, the local parishes? So, there were reasons uh, over and beyond the middle class assertion. Nevertheless, the pressure for it also came from liberal notions of efficiency. Right, and this is a new kind of ethical intervention redefinition that is uh, being being carried out here. So those were to stop parish workhouses, uh, inmates were to accept work even outside uh, their uh, local parishes, despite being poorly paid. Then uh, there is a central board of commissioners located in London, which was to administer a union of parishes. So these are some of the changes uh, with respect to uh, uh, poor law or laws related to the poors that we get to see during the uh, march of liberalism. Now, uh, inspiring these new legislations uh, was also the belief that poverty was a person's own fault and that capitalism, uh, although capitalism would go unregulated and that is what the middle class wanted, uh, was capable of providing enough job for all those who genuinely wanted them. So, this was the understanding that was sought to be grafted uh, to public at large by the middle class uh, in terms of the optics generated by capitalism. Uh, so, there is that sense of optimism with which they want to launch a capitalist ethos to public at large. Uh, there were economic depressions of the 1840s uh, that uh, obviously had uh, proven these assumptions to be wrong, that optimism about uh, capitalism being able to take care of uh, poverty, etc., uh, that were proved wrong. Nevertheless, it did not shake the liberal conviction that poverty was in the ultimate analysis, an individual and not an institutional failure. So, uh, at the level of idea, this is something that we get to see. Another important uh, landmark uh, with which one can gauze the uh, assertion of the middle class is the repeal of the corn laws. I have uh, again earlier referred to this dilution of the corn laws. Now, it happens in terms of doing away with it. So, in 1846, uh, the anti-corn law league uh, could could uh, uh, succeed uh, in uh, persuading uh, the then Prime Minister of Britain and uh, also it lobbied with the parliamentarians to repeal this law. And uh, just understand, uh, uh, and again I am not going to uh, explain this because I have done it earlier as to how corn laws uh, actually uh, or this repeal of corn laws uh, meant or it, it displayed the rising power of the middle class because uh, of the tariff issues and uh, how middle class uh, benefited out of it and how the traditional uh, class uh, of the aristocracy and landholders actually uh, were at the receiving end. So much so, so, so uh, profound was the impact of this uh, repeal that uh, the Tories uh, uh, who were considered to be the conservative elements in British politics were split on this issue. Uh, at a uh, notional level or you can say in terms of religious sensibilities, uh, again you find some kind of a change uh, triggered by this transition. Uh, ability of the individual to attain salvation as an idea 
uh, was being furthered now. And this uh, was in tandem with the uh, aspirations of the middle class. And this went against the Calvinist doctrine of predestined elect. But it accorded well with the middle class notion of individualism and responsibility of the individual in their own well-being. So, this Calvinist idea of predestined elect where one was not sure uh, uh, like uh, if you are doing good uh, in your life, whether you would be uh, selected by God or you would be elected by God uh, for salvation, there was no link. But this idea is now getting uh, diluted, jettisoned. Rather, uh, salvation or your probability of salvation is being linked to what you do and that gives you a lot of control over uh, you as an individual and accord responsibility to yourself for your own well-being. There were several other positive uh, uh, changes uh, also that we get to see as a, uh, as a result of this spread of liberalism uh, in Britain uh, during this period, 1833. Uh, the slave trade was abolished in the British colonies. There were several uh, factory acts which limited uh, the duration of the working hours, particularly the child labor. And by 1847, we uh, find that uh, this duration was reduced to 10 hours. Similarly, uh, the uh, assertion of the middle class is also evident in the state uh, grants to school that were run by the church meeting uh, with resistance by the middle class. So, uh, middle class, uh, uh, you know, don't like this. They said that they are, this church is trying to influence uh, people uh, differently and uh, that does not go well with the middle class ethos. And rather, uh, there's this business of running the school and or, or e e even if uh, the church uh, uh, manages it, uh, school education, uh, state at least should not be uh, very generous in uh, giving them grants, right? So, the power of economics is very evident, profit and so forth, rationality, reason and so forth, they, they are all coming into play. Uh, hence, uh, what we find is that there is a clash of laws of classical economics with several other prejudices and beliefs and overall the middle class emerges as a confused and ambivalent lot. Now, what is happening to the radical component of the middle class, the lower order uh, of the middle class? The radicals among the middle class, uh, particularly the lower middle and the working classes, so far uh, who had uh, assisted the middle class, if not propelled the forces of liberalism to victory in 1830 and 32, were now growing increasingly dissatisfied with the results of their efforts because whatever uh, benefits was occurring, they were occurring to the top uh, section of the middle class and that is giving a subjective sense of oneness or some kind of distinctiveness to the working class. Remember, working class is not out as a force, as a distinct force still around this point of time, but it's becoming, uh, it's in its incipient stage. Slowly, they are realizing that their interest can be taken uh, well care of uh, as a separate entity rather than as a larger coalition uh, under the middle class. Hence, uh, you have a spurt in trade unionism, friendly societies, cooperatives come, come up in a big way, uh, riots uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, riots are happening uh, and then uh, uh, several uh, revolts against uh, introduction uh, of machinery itself. Uh, in Britain, uh, these uh, radical component of the middle class resorting to these techniques and ideology were referred to as Luddites after uh, a mythical figure, Ned uh, Ludd. And uh, however, uh, overall, the trade unions could not emerge in Europe as an effective force uh, till around the middle of the uh, 19th century. Uh, they had some sporadic, uh, you know, flashes of, uh, uh, you know, assertion, but uh, somehow uh, they were uh, the uh, the ruling class, uh, the middle class, uh, in associate uh, in association with the conservatives, were able to contain uh, the uh, the 
uh, radical uh, section and the working class. Uh, for example, in 1834, there was uh, this Grand National Consolidated Trade Union of Great Britain and Ireland that was organized by the artisans of London. Uh, however, the government uh, could uh, stifle their opportunities for further organization. So, these are uh, some of the uh, instances that could have translated into a full-fledged trade union, uh, uh, but, but it could not. Hence, movement from radical trade unionism to political activity through people's charter uh, followed and you have six demands uh, articulated by the chartists uh, which included universal male suffrage, secret ballot, abolition of property qualification in lower house, annual parliamentary elections, salaries for lower house members, equal ele electoral districts. So, uh, overall what you find is that the radical element uh, is tested, uh, government uh, hits hard, they again resort to petitioning and so forth. So, overall there is ambivalence with respect to uh, the end and means uh, by the chartists, whether to use petitions or to uh, use the violent means. Some even argued for a return to the pre-industrial society. Uh, the revolutionary outbreaks across Europe in 1848 somewhat inspired the Chartist leaders to plan a major demonstration in London, but again it was put off. So, that by and large uh, sums up the situation uh, with respect to the radical elements within the middle class. Of course, they are to become more assertive and they become more uh, prominent in the second half of the 19th century. But since our discussion was limited to 1848 period, therefore, till around this point of time, this is the scenario that you get to see with respect to the assertion of liberalism and the middle class uh, as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a social uh, section or as a, uh, as a group, right? So, uh, that is it. Thank you.